This conference will now be Okay, so welcome to the class. And today we'll be doing uh, a bit different and difficult topic. That is a heart disease in pregnancy. And I'll try to cover both the things that is required for part two and part three. I have tried the uh, uh, simplify the topic as much as possible. Hope it helps you. And uh, so I'll be just going uh, for the clinical part that is required for the examination, okay? So I won't be doing physiology and pathology for all these heart lesions, okay? So now, just starting with the, uh, what are the cardiovascular changes or adaptation that happens in pregnancy? Okay, few things are important to understand, uh, not much uh, in details. So some parameters, they, they, uh, they increase in pregnancy. Okay, so there is increase in the cardiac output and this is by 40%. Okay, so uh, you get question from there also, and it is also important to understand that if the cardiac output uh, increases and what time it will be maximum, so that will be the possible uh, time in the pregnancy uh, or postpartum er uh, er uh, time when the increased chances of heart failure is there. Okay, so increase in cardiac output for, uh, 40%, increase in heart rate that is uh, 20, uh, 10 to 20 beats per minute. Increase in stroke volume and increase in preload. Okay, so these are the cardiac parameters. They increase in pregnancy in way to do adaptation to the increased demands of pregnancy. Apart from this, certain decreases also happen. So decrease in the blood pressure. Now, decrease in the blood pressure occur in first and second trimester because uh, uh, there is. Uh, 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 there is an increase decrease in all these uh, vascular resistances but blood pressure drop will happen in first and second trimester now in third trimester either the blood pressure will remain same or it may increase also okay therefore whatever the pre eclampsia thing happens so uh, uh, 20 weeks is a marker for that because before that there is a physiological fall in the blood pressure Okay, so blood pressure will um, decrease in the first and second trimester of pregnancy. That is a normal physiological change of pregnancy. Then either it will remain the same or it may start increasing. Okay, so, uh, so this is all about blood pressure. Then systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance. So all these things, SVR and PVR, they increase because there occurs vasodilatation that we know because of the effect of uh, in progesterone and other pregnancy hormone. And there occurs because uh, all this, there is an uh, increase in the vascular resistance. So blood remains mo most of the time in the vessels. So there is a decrease in the afterload. Okay, so this part is important because any any anything from here can be asked in the questions also. And it is important, few things minimum from the physiology you have to know as well. Now, this is a pictorial depiction to see that during pregnancy, there is increase in the preload, okay? Because if we have a picture, then the memory becomes more better. Then uh, during pregnancy, there is a decrease in the afterload. Because this uh, that I already told you, there is a less systemic resistance. Okay, because of the less in systemic resistance, there is a less pressure is required to expel blood from the ventricle. So there is a decrease in the afterload. Fine. These are few of the physiological thing. Now, cardiac output overall, if we see, there is an increase in 40% in the cardiac output. Then now you have to understand what are the area, where, uh, in which, what are the times of uh, during the pregnancy and post partum period where heart uh, cardiac output is more so during if you see in the pregnancy it reaches peak at about 28 to 30 weeks or 32 weeks of pregnancy okay so if a heart failure occur in pregnancy it will occur at this time then for then it further cardiac output rises in the second stage of labor and also it rises in the immediate postpartum so these are the uh, uh, areas or these are the time when there are very uh, high chances of heart failure. 
therefore whenever we uh, that's, that we know also that whenever there is a delivery for the cardiac patient we always uh, try to uh, cut short the second stage of labor either we offer them operative delivery or you know uh, because we allow them not to push so this is the reason because so much of cardiac changes are happening and in cardiac is in second stage of labor cardiac outpost is uh, so much increase in the cardiac output is there now you'll be able to understand why this is it uh, 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 like we have to decrease the second stage of labor if the cardiac woman is in the labor okay now a few things also you have to understand is this nyha classification this is important for both part 2 and part 3 people because in part 3 people uh, if the uh, role player is there um, in the station then you have to find out the class class uh, nyha classification for, uh, from that patient then you'll be able to find out whether this patient can continue with the pregnancy or not so you have to know this classification then if the class one is there then there will be no limitation of physical activity and there will be no symptoms on ordinary activity in in class two there will be slight limitation of physical activity and if they do only uh, ordinary activity that can cause symptoms okay then uh, in class three there is a marked limitation of activity even doing very less than uh, activity it causes uh, symptoms to these patients but they are um, they have got no issues when they are at rest but in class 4 people they are symptomatic um, even the rest okay so class 1 if the patient has got a heart condition in the class 1 and class um, class 2 then she can tolerate pregnancy but class 3 and class 4 is real difficult now because sometimes if a woman is in the class 3 or class 4 we have to uh, advise them for even the termination also because there is too much limitation of the activity therefore this classification is important now this is important for part two people because you may get question from there so there is a car preg score is there so according uh, question can come from here these percentages and also you have to know this so they they uh, what this score does they uh, they do the scoring on the basis of certain factors and then they calculate what could be the risk of cardiac complication that can happen in the pregnancy now these are the criteria so if nyha more than class 2 just uh, we discussed if it is more than 2 that means either she is class 3 or 4 if left heart obstruction is there if ejection fraction is less than 40 okay and if any previous cardiovascular event has already happened like any history is there so it could be in the form of edema, arrhythmia, or in the form of CVO or TIA. So if the every one of this are given a score of one, now you have to calculate the scoring. If the score is zero, then chances of having cardiac complication will be five uh, percent. Okay. If it is one, then chances is twenty-seven percent, and if it is more than one. That means patient has got more than one of this factor, then it will be 75%. You, you, part two people may be asked question from this, okay? Not important, this slide is not important for part three. Part three and uh, YHA classification, you have to know because you have to ask this from the role player. Now, uh, uh, heart lesions or heart disease, we can uh, divide in two parts. There will be some congenital heart uh, lesions and they will be acquired. So uh, um, now first we'll start with the congenital heart lesion. And uh, so the, uh, from this slide, you will get a lot of questions, okay? So uh, uh, like uh, if the, uh, the mother has a cardiac heart disease or congenital heart disease, then baby will have 6% risk. If father has congenital heart disease, baby will have 2% risk. If one previous child is there, baby will have two to five percent chances of risk if two previous child with congenital heart disease then third pregnancy can have 10 to 15 percent okay and overall if they are asking you one number so it will be in somewhere between two to five percent this number and this uh, slide uh, i have taken from strategy so this percentages questions are real important 
for uh, part two people you have to remember them as it is but for part three people at least one number they have to remember because if the station comes they have to counsel because this role player will ask what are the chances my baby will have the same disease okay then it also depends upon the type of lesion like for if the congenital aortic stenosis is there then it goes a, it has a very highest risk like 1 to 20 percent of the um, pregnancy uh, like chances that it can happen to the baby okay so this table you have to remember and the reliable it is from the reliable source from the strategy so you can get direct question from here now in half of the uh, cases congenital heart disease or abnormality will be same as of the pa uh, parent so if mother has uh, any condition baby uh, in half of the cases will have the same condition therefore if a mo mother has a heart disease or or if a father have a heart disease congenital heart disease fetal echo will be offered so you know you may get question from this line so this line is important to you know understand so uh, take home the message is either, either of the parent, mother or father, if history of <coughs> cardiac um, uh, congenital heart disease is there, so fetal echo has to be offered. Okay, you can get question from this line. Then uh, what? The, so there are certain, some low risk lesions are there. So what are the low risk lesion when uh, there is a very small uh, left to right shunt is there? okay so left to uh, uh, right shunt is there so it is a bit uh, you know like it causes less problem because blood is going from left side to right side that means oxygenated blood is going towards the deoxygenated blood so it makes less difference in the pregnancy okay so the small left to right shunt are the well tolerated lesions okay so now what are the uh, what are the lesions they can cause left to right shunt is so one of them first is asd is in the, again question from this line asd is the commonest uh, uh, congenital heart disease in the woman okay you may get question from here and it is usually well tolerated because very small left left to right shunt is there but if your patient comes to you before getting pregnant so uh, they would be advised closer why closer because if closer is not done so there is a risk of paradoxical embolism and what is this paradoxical embolism uh, that if in, uh, thrombus can crosses from intercardiac defect into systemic circulation so this is the definition of paradoxical embolism okay so there is a risk of paradoxical embolism therefore we advise them to have a closer before they uh, embark on pregnancy so that's this much information is required about asd and vsd second common so here uh, if it is less than 1.25 centimeter then chances of complication in the form of pulmonary hypertension and heart failure are less likely to develop pregnancy is usually well tolerated but if you find patient if she is coming for preconception counseling, and if you if you are, are able to diagnose VSD, so it will be uh, sensible to do the surgery or to consider closer be, uh, before she get uh, start, uh, planned pregnancy because again there is a risk of paradoxical embolism and also uh, there could be pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so uh, I uh, that will help in you know answering your question as well. So if she, you find a patient before uh, getting pregnant, so it, they should be consideration for closer should be done to, to avoid this complication of paradoxical embolism and pulmonary hypertension. Apart from this, it is PDA, that is a patent ductus uh, arteriosus. The, it is used again well tolerated, but if uh, it is clinically evident symptoms are there, so it should be considered closed prior to pregnancy because if the cases are unpredicted, uncorrected, so there could be possibility of heart strain and heart failure in the pregnancy. This much knowledge is enough. More than that, you guys will not be asked question about this low risk lesions, okay? Another is a congenital lesion. You can get question from here. Is a congenital coarctation of aorta, okay? 
so ideally if the congenital correctation of aorta is there it should be corrected prior pregnancy what are the risk if it is left uncorrected there could be angina there could be hypertension and there could be um, heart failure okay so usually you may get a scenario uh, where they will give you features of uh, angina they will show patient as a high blood pressure and uh, and also they will show some features of heart failure then you have to diagnose the condition and then your answer will be congenital correctation of aorta and uh, ideally if the correction had happened now another set of uh, patients where uh, only uh, already correction had happened then what could be the issue so uh, at the side, side below the site of uh, a correction there could be post stenotic dilatation okay so uh, or there could be aneurysm again that in aorta if any dilatation is there so we have to take care before pregnancy so mri has to be advised okay why why we are so much worried because we already know because of the pregnancy there is so much increase in the cardiac output so there could be possibility of aortic dissection and aortic dissection as you already know it is an emergency even the risk to life is there so to avoid this risk of aortic uh, dissection uh, usually the treatment what will be the treatment you have to decrease the heart rate or cardiac contractility so uh, a beta blocker and there should be strict control of blood pressure so you have to keep cardiac contractility and blood volume in the form of blood pressure in the control so uh, like uh, strict control of blood pressure and beta blocker is sort of a treatment so the two way you can get question from here either you will get some symptoms like angina hypertension and cardiac failure and you have to mark this answer uh, diagnosis will be congenital correctation of aorta or uh, they will give you um, uh, like uh, patient has undergone uh this repair so what next treatment is required next line of investigation is required before she plan pregnancy so answer would be mri and why to uh, exclude any aneurysm or any post stenotic dilatation okay so this is uh, uh, this much you should know about the congenital correctation of aorta till now any one of you have got any question before i move ahead anyone want to ask any question okay no question then fine now this is real this is very important because it is important for both part two people and part three people part three people it is a marfan syndrome is a station okay so you have to know uh, about uh, uh, like marfan syndrome and part two a number of question comes okay so marfan syndrome is autosomal dominant that we already know it has got like all other features are there there is a um, uh, like patient will be tall there will be increased arm span there would be you know a history of joint uh, dislocation there could be problem with the lens dislocation eye problems so all these are other problems are there but what could be the cardiac problems so i have highlighted only cardiac problems but all these are the other symptom of marfan syndrome so what could be the uh, uh, what what are the cardiac uh, thing that had happens in the marfan syndrome so there is a mitral wall prolapse so it is a condition with after contraction a part of wall you know it uh, it will pro, it will prolapse and mitral wall will be not be completely closed so this condition is called as mitral wall prolapse and how you will diagnose so there will be uh, when when mitral wall prolapse is there usually a click type of murmur you will find so sometime you will find a question then uh, they will give you some hint like uh, all of a sudden uh, the click murmur is there so that will help you you know in uh, marking your question so click murmur so that means you are you are doing you are dealing with the uh, mitral wall prolapse okay another thing that can happen is mitral regurgitation third thing what we are worried about is the aortic root dilatation now too much we are worried about one thing that is aortic root dilatation 
because there is a again there is a risk of aortic dissection or aortic rupture during pregnancy this is the most important thing we are worried about therefore whenever this pregnancy is there so we uh, during pregnancy um, aortic root uh, surveillance is required so they these women during pregnancy they will have frequent echo checks okay then what could be the predictors for dissection and rupture of aorta so pre existing root dilatation and previous history of di uh, dissection and rupture so this is quite simple if uh, a previous dissection is there the more possibility that it will go it will happen again and if there is any pre existing dilatation is there then there is a risk so uh, if it is more than 4 then there is a 10% risk that um, uh, this, uh, aortic dissection can happen okay and that is a uh, uh, and if it is less than 4 then there is only 1% chance so this number is important because you will get question from there even the part 3 people they have to tell this number to their role player fine so therefore it is important now uh, what could be the management you can do if the patient has Marfan syndrome? Usually, content, if the aortic root uh, is more than 4.5 centimeter, so pregnancy is contraindicated. You can, part two people can get this as a question, and part three people can get in the station. Now, whenever the station is coming, so usually uh, um, they write eco report also. So if in if it in uh, eco report they uh, put something about aortic root and you find the diameter is more than 4.5, so you have to counsel this role player uh, as a contra that she has got a contraindication of pregnancy. Okay, therefore this knowledge is important. Then if it is uh, more than 4.5 centimeter before pregnancy, so before uh, ideally this patient they should be offered aortic root replacement okay prior to pregnancy then what could be the treatment it would be beta blocker why same because we don't want heart to contract more and heart rate to be more because more the heart will contract more will be the tachycardia more will be the chances of dissection then this part i already told in the pregnancy there will be regular checks with the echocardiogram or echo for, uh, because for to see the how much dilatation is happening in the aortic root as a effect of pregnancy now uh, pay, uh, before you decide for the delivery so if it is more less than 4.5 you can plan uh, delivery for this patient but if it is more than 4.5 okay in that particular situation delivery is contraindicated or it should not happen there will be risk of dissection so elective cesarean section should be recommended so the, all this knowledge is important because part two people will get question and part three people they have station also so i have made it that way so the even it will cover the knowledge part of part three as well so is it clear any question Ma'am, at 4.5 centimeter, like between 4 and 4.5 centimeter, how do we proceed in management? Uh, uh, but see, if it is less than 4.5, you can, if this patient can go ahead and go with the uh, delivery also. But it will be absolute contraindication when it crosses 4.5. So 4.5 is sort of a marker. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, teratology of phallot. Few, only one or two questions come from here. So, what are the four features of this teratology? So, there will be VSD, there will be pulmonary artery stenosis, overriding aorta, and RVH or right ventricular hypertrophy. So, these four things, part two people, you, you have to know because you know you may be asked question from here. Apart from this, what you have to know that uh, this is a synotic heart disease. Okay, so if it is a synotic heart disease, because there will be a left, right to left shunt here. So there will be, uh, if it is uncorrected and pregnancy happens, so because of right to left shunt, there will be cyanosis. And if the cyanosis occurs, 
in the pregnancy so all complications are going to happen because there will be so much of deoxygenated blood fine now on the other side if they have corrected uh, uh, like they do surgery for uh, teratology of a lot if the surgery has been done and ventricular function of this patient is good and there is no right ventricular outflow tract obstruction in that uh, patient pregnancy will be well tolerated so this much only you have to know that uh, teratology of helot has got four cardiac problems this you have to know apart from this if it is uncorrected and pregnancy happens there would be uh, right to left shunt there will be increase deoxygenated blood there would be a cyanosis and that will lead to pregnancy uh, complications but if it is well corrected and well treated uh, 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 like teratology of alert and ventricular function is good there there is no obstruction right ventricular flow tract obstruction then pregnancy will be well tolerated it is not important for part 3 people but part 2 people only this much knowledge is important because sometimes they ask question from here now fontans circulation only to understand i have never seen question from here so if any surgery happens for tricuspid atresia or tga transposition of great vessels then usually after surgery the these people will have single ventricle okay so because right ventricle is bypassed so left ventricle it will provide both pulmonary and systemic circulation okay so these people they have single ventricle and because of that that is working for both circulation systemic and pulmonary and because of that there is increased chances of uh, hepatic congestion edema and as the one ventricle is working so you can even think if the one work, one ventricle is working so ventricle will be slightly slow in working so there will be increased chances of a clot because of that slowing so women has to be anticoagulated okay this much knowledge is enough because question doesn't come but this terminology is used so much so you have to have an idea that what is fontan circulation and if the woman has for fontans repair and if she consider pregnancy so there will be 30% um, fetal loss rate okay because one uh, ventricle is doing work for both circulation how much a pregnancy survive so there is 30% chances of fetal loss i have never seen a question from fontan circulation only this much knowledge would be uh, enough for you guys then it is real important to know about pulmonary hypertension because you will get question from pulmonary hypertension in part 2 and there is a station for pulmonary hypertension in part 3 so you knowledge is important here so what are the reasons pulmonary hypertension it could be idiopathic it could be associated uh, with some uh, congenital heart disease it could be associated with asd vsd and if um, uh, it could be esenmenger syndrome where pulmonary hypertension is there with a the reverse shunt it could be because of lung disease cystic fibrosis in interstitial lung disease connective tissue disorder so all these are the um, like uh, you can you can say it these are the sort of etiology for pulmonary hypertension okay so uh, uh, just this is required for the knowledge so what could be the etiology for it then why we are so much worried because uh there is a uh, uh, these kind of women with the pulmonary hypertension or with the eisenmenger syndrome maternal mortality is very high and it is 30% you have to remember this number 30% okay you will get question in the part 2 and also you have to tell this number to part 3 station role player you have to tell what are the risk for her life okay and so this if the pregnancy is continued but if this role player or if a patient with pulmonary hypertension if she consider for termination then also there is a risk of maternal death that is 7% so with the continuation of pregnancy maternal mortality is 30% and with the termination of pregnancy it is 7% with pulmonary hypertension 
both of these numbers are important for you people for part two and part three both because this number you have to explain to role player also in the station then whenever you find a patient um, with the sn menger syndrome or pulmonary hypertension because of such a high mortality rate you would counsel them for termination or if she is not pregnant and she has come for the counseling then you will give advice her uh, or you will advise her not to get pregnant so you have to offer them good contraceptive uh, advice mm -hmm. ideally progesterone implants are considered good for these kind of patient so these are the uh, area from where you will find a lot of questions okay and by the pro what can be the fetal problem again as the right to left shunt is there so there is cyanosis low oxygen saturation and because of that there could be polycythemia and very poor fetal outcome okay so these issues can be there but usually uh, questions are asked about the mortality rate mm -hmm. about the uh, this thing about the uh, contraceptive so you have to tell them now uh, though in the pulmonary hypertension patient we discourage them to get pregnant okay but still some women will go ahead with the pregnancy so what could be the antenatal care usually these kind of drugs they were on so these are uh, phosphodiesterase uh, inhibitor sildana sildanafil or endothelial receptor uh, uh, antagonist bosentan so why uh, uh, i am speaking about them because in your question you will find these drugs okay though is deep knowledge in depth knowledge is not required but usually these drugs are discontinued in the pregnancy sometime they will be on the prostenoid analog that is iloprost okay only you have to you know get to know the name of these drugs because whenever you get question for part 3 or part 2 so she will be on these drugs okay so you have to know this apart from this thromboprophylaxis with a uh, uh, low molecular weight will be uh, individualized for this patient and sometime because so much problem is there because of this cyanosis elective admission would be required for bed rest oxygen therapy and uh, so that uh, like a targeted therapy can be given to this patient so these are very high risk patient why because so much of problem and high risk of mortality and also the fetal complication now if a patient uh, with a pulmonary hypertension and she is in uh, like intrapartum uh, uh, like she is in labor or uh, you have to deliver that patient so again it has to be in a intensive care unit high dependency care and multidisciplinary care okay and what you should avoid i have put only th this much so if any question comes or if you have to tell something in this uh, in the part 3 station so you have to know this so you have to avoid hypovolemia so bleeding should not happen they, there will be less tolerance to them uh, you need to avoid uh, thromboembolism so uh, vt risk assessment has to be done avoiding pulmonary artery catheterization and avoiding systemic vasodilatation so any bleeding any hydrocytosinone or regional anesthesia all of them will be causing vasodilatation that will be poorly tolerated in this kind of patients so detailed uh, thing uh, of intrapartum i have never put in the uh, here because that is not required only you may get question what the care you have to taken so that avoid what was important so i have only put that so any question about pulmonary hypertension or anything ma'am any contraindications to vaginal delivery in because of pulmonary hypertension no they have not mentioned okay, thank you now uh, this is important for part 2 people i have seen question from this syndrome so this is uh, di george syndrome or so usually in a uh, question comes what is the chromosome affected so chromosome affected is long arm or q arm of chromosome 22 so this much knowledge is important for part 2 people and what could be the associated abno cardiac abnormalities so this i have put uh, from the uh, internet so there would be interrupted aortic arc trunc uh, truncus atriosus 
and teratology of phallots. So these are the things that can happen associated with the D. George syndrome. There could be uh, abnormal faces, there could be thymic aplasia, there could be cleft palate, there could be hypocalcemia. So this is caused as summarized as a catch 22 syndrome. Okay. So this is usually asked in part two. This is important only for part two. So the, here is the summary. You can read here is the summary. So in D. George syndrome, there will be 22 Q deletion. There will be 50% uh, inheritation because it is a, uh, I think it is a dominant disease or what. Okay, but uh, it is one to two, one is to two inheritance. Apart from this, there is 10% chances. There is only 10% chances of congenital heart disease. This slide, what this pink, uh, this colored picture is also from strategy. Okay, so this summary, in summary, only these three lines and uh, D. George syndrome, what is this uh, catch 22? Okay, all these things you have to know. And because you will find question from the cardiac anomaly and also uh, what, what is the, like which chromosome is affected? Third question, it could be uh, like long arm deletion. So all these things you have to know because it, I have seen this question many times. This much information is enough. So that's all, that uh, finishes the congenital cardiac disease. So um, now I'll be moving towards acquired uh, cardiac lesions. So any question before we I move towards uh, acquired cardiac lesions? Uh, Ma'am, I have one doubt. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, in pul uh, you have taught in the pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary hypertension in intrapartum yes. period to avoid the vasodilation. Ma'am, I am unable to correlate the mechanism. Yes, Ma'am. How, yes. how the systemic vasodilators hampers the pulmonary hypertension? Ma'am, I am unable to correlate that situation in pulmonary yeah, hypertension and avoidance of vasodilation okay uh, basically uh, you know i'm not going in the that uh, physiology part okay but uh, systemic dilatation will cause less uh, like blood to, uh, reaching towards uh, this thing to heart so there will be less blood going so uh, um, on the other side there will be less cardiac output so if there is a less cardiac output, so a patient will have a, a very high chances of getting a high cardiac failure. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so a covid cardiac lesion. So you will get question from my cardiac infections. And this is a talk 2013. So I have put uh, uh, all, uh, what are the question that will come from in myocardial infection is answer will come from this talk only, okay. So first of all, question will come, what are the risk factors for myocardial infections? So you have to know this because uh, for part two people, uh, this table is important. Parity, more than three. Age, more than 35. The question will come from here. Pre-existing heart condition, hypertension, smoking, obesity, family history. This is, you know, everybody knows this. Then pregnancy related risk factor for myocardial infarction. It could be preeclampsia, it could be thrombophilia, it could be migraine headache, postpartum infections, and blood transfusion, hyperlipidemia, and preeclampsia, thrombophilia. Everybody knows that. But please take care of this thing. Migraine headache is a reason for myocardial infection, sort of a fact. It is a risk factor, even postpartum infections also. Okay, so you have to understand this and blood transfusion. So these three things you have to uh, um, understand because when the SBA comes, unless you know the things clearly, so you are going to make mistake. Then you will get question from here. So maternal death risk is greatest if the infarction occur in late pregnancy and if uh, uh, like uh, delivery happens within two weeks of MI. So chances of maternal risk is very high. Therefore, you will see in uh, upcoming slides that uh, if a patient has MI in pregnancy, delivery is delayed by two to three weeks. Okay, this is because the heart will get time to get settled. Otherwise, because of the uh, uh, hemodynamic 
changes that will occur during delivery that will increase chances of maternal death okay so you can get a question from this line also then uh, we already know that uh, when the mi occurs uh, like in all other patients usually uh, it occurs because of uh, uh, like uh, the aortic wall uh, like some clot is there or uh, erythrosclerosis is there okay usually there is a erythrosclerosis of arteries because of that that would be the reason for mi but in pregnancy the condition is it is not because of um, the coronary atherosclerosis coronary artery dissection okay if there is because M, A, mi will occur when there is no associated cardiovascular risk factor so what could be the answer reason for uh, mi in pregnant women so answer will come from coronary artery dissection there is a sba for this also okay and uh, when there is a risk of uh, coronary artery dissection it is late, late third trimester or late pregnancy up to three months postpartum so you can get you will get question from this line apart from this which artery is affected in 80 percent of the cases it is lad left anterior descending coronary artery is affected you will get question from here and associated mortality range is 30 to 40 percent so from this slide you will get a number of question for part two people now so we know it it will be so first uh, uh, first reason for mi in pregnancy will be coronary artery dissection second will be coronary artery uh, thrombosis and another will be coronary artery spasm so the, it could be drug induced also this drugs you have to remember terbutaline argometrin bromocriptine and cocaine okay so these are the uh, drugs that could lead to uh, like coronary artery spasm so you may get this in the question as well now you will get question from this slide also so they gave uh, usually question is given from this table only therefore I, I have directly put this table so what is the so if the ecg is done in pregnant patient so there are certain normal variations are also there so you have to know all this normal variation and if you know the normal sometime question will come from this part sometime question will come from uh, mi changes uh, that uh, ecg changes that happens in mi okay so basically you have to know both and uh, like uh, i myself a person who has got very limited knowledge of ecg so i have i sort of uh, used to remember this so if a person anywhere of you you know how to read ecg well so for you guys the things will be easy okay otherwise you have to mug up only if you don't know how to read ecg so what could be the normal variation in pregnancy so we already know in the pregnancy a heart is uh, like uh, slightly shifted towards left so 15 to 20 degrees left axis de deviations it is easy to know then there will be st segment depression in pregnancy there will be t wave inversion in inferior and lateral leads there will be small q wave in uh, an inverted t wave in lead 3 and q wave in lead avf inverted t waves in v1 v2 and occasionally v3 basically i have got very limited knowledge or no knowledge about this so this uh, uh, but the question comes from here so you have to you know know this then another question comes what will be the most common change that occur in um, acute myocardial infarction so usually st elevation also occurs st depression also occurs and there is a symmetrical t wave inversion you can see in normal pregnancy t wave inversion is there only in inferior and lateral leads but it will be symmetrically inverted in a, a, a in myocardial infection and there will be uh, newly developed q waves so these four things are there and if the question comes what is the most significant ecg change so answer will be st elevation okay so this is all about ecg normal variation and what happens in ami then how, what how you will diagnose uh, like uh, 
this ami so first will be ecg only okay when a woman or anyone come with a chest pain first diagnostic first diagnosis test what we uh, do is ecg so in the ecg the, if it is a st elevation so it will be the more specific marker and usually it will appear within a few minutes of uh, cardiac uh, this thing uh, uh, only in a few minutes of cardiac uh, when the mi had happened okay now another they can do a blood test so that is a, a troponin levels and this troponin level uh, usually uh, it is not increased in the upper limit in healthy women and it is not affected by anesthesia not affected by prolonged labor or cesarean section therefore it is a investigation of choice troponin okay uh, then another will be eco and coronary uh, angiography uh, aids in diagnosis also and it helps in treatment also so this way the diagnosis uh, for uh, mi will happen uh, in the pregnant patient okay is it clear though it is from the tog only now what will be the treatment so treatment usually you know it will depend upon the ecg change so if it is a est elevation myocardial infection or stemi it is a myocardial infection where st elevation is there then treatment of choice will be ppci what is this ppci it is a coronary angiography and the primary percutaneous coronary intervention okay so this ppci is a treatment of choice if it is uh, st elevation mi second if it is non st elevation mi then the line of treatment will be drug so in that situation we have to give them drug so that um, uh, more thrombus should not happen and that facilitates the clot dissolution and increase blood flow to the myocardium so this kind of drug can be used so this table is again important because you may get question from there also so what the uh, uh, like what type of drug that can be used and what are contraindicated in the pregnancy so the, uh, this statins and uh, ace inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers so these are contraindicated in pregnancy fine then what are the safely used drugs that you also can see from this table because you will get question from here also so aspirin nifedipine labetalol and heparin these are uh, can be used safely in the pregnancy for uh, this uh, uh, cloppy dogrel there is a limited evidence okay it can be used if there had been no other event, uh, alternate treatment is not there so this table is also important that will that is the medical that is for the medical management of ami in pregnancy okay so you will get question from there also now uh, uh, i have put the summary intra part uh, of this from this talk so what will be the intra partum care uh, do, uh, for the woman who had mi so ideally delivery should be delayed by 2 3 weeks this this i already explained because there is very high risk of maternal death within first if the delivery happens within 2 weeks so uh, we try to delay the delivery by 2 to 3 weeks okay uh, then uh, uh, if the woman is in the labor so the, it will be multidisciplinary approach or she should get oxygen they should be monitoring so monitoring will be done by the ecg it will be by the pulse oxy oximetry and continuous ctg for the baby epidural can be offered second stage of labor we have to reduce i have already explained why in the cardiac patient we reduce second stage of labor because of the in, there is a very high a cardiac output that may lead to a heart failure so we uh, want to reduce second stage of labor we want them to avoid pushing so the option what is offered is a instrumental birth okay then if for the third stage of uh, active management for third stage of labor usually im oxytocin is given so that is sort of a bolus dose if that much bolus dose is given then it may lead to a uh, systemic hypotension to avoid this uh, avoid this smaller dose of intravenous infusion of oxytocin is used so this is the doses less than 2 unit per minute so it is given by iv infusion set okay so this also you have to know methargin is contraindicated because there could be the risk of uh, because um, coronary artery spasm can happen 
and after delivery um, women will be in hdu for at least 24 to 48 hours and there has to have a, a vt risk assessment so these are the sum up of the care that is required for the intrapartum uh, care for a woman who had an mi okay this is from the talk only so anything about the am uh, um, uh, mi if you people have any question can ask me any question about mi no question okay now uh, next will be the cardiomyopathies so you uh, you will get a number of questions from cardiomyopathy and also part uh, three people they have a station for cardiomyopathy so it is important to know there are three types of uh, cardiomyopathy okay now peripartum cardiomyopathy peripartum cardiomyopathy is real important because there is a station for part three and part two people will find a number of questions for from the peripartum cardiomyopathy so peripartum uh, cardiomyopathy usually occurs in uh, near term or you can say in last trimester and first few weeks of postpartum up to five months of postpartum so if the cardiomyopathy happens so it will be peripartum cardiomyopathy what are the risk factor okay what do you look for so i usually these are uh, older women these are uh, black women these are multi parents women suffering for hypertension and or pet so you will find a scenario where all, a few things you will find from there so idea usually this woman will be within the uh, uh, last trimester or she will be in the first five months of postpartum period and all, uh, for some of uh, risk factor you will find from here also okay but in it can happen in a woman without the risk factor also. So if any unexplained breathlessness, tachycardia, edema, anything such kind of cardiac symptoms are there, immediate cardio, uh, echocardiography has to be done. Okay, so, and uh, what the uh, embrace report, what is the message from 2016 embrace report? If there is a raised respiratory rate, persistent tachycardia and orthopnea, Orthopnea is a condition where women have a breathing problem on lying down. Okay, so they should always be investigated. So uh, now you will you will get a scenario where patient will have tachycardia, respiratory rate may be high, and she will have orthopnea, and she will have some of this risk factor, and this will be time period of pregnancy and postpartum. So your answer will put putting all these things in the question. Your answer will be towards peripartum cardiomyopathy. Now, how the diagnosis is done? So usually diagnosis has to be done with the echocardiography. So ejection fraction will be less than 45%. Okay, then uh, left end diastolic volume diameter will be more than 2.7. But you will not be able to remember this, but ejection fraction less than 45. This everyone has to remember. And echocardiography will show heart is enlarged globe, and there will be globular dilatation of all four chambers. With left uh, ventricular function will be reduced. Therefore, ejection fraction is less than 45%. Okay, so you will find this also in the question. Then what could be the you know treatment? So whenever uh, you find a patient of PPECM, I uh, if she is pregnant patient, she has to del get delivered. So elective delivery, thromboprophylaxis, beta blocker, then ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Okay, this part is not that important, uh, but you have to know about the elective delivery. Then there is a risk of recurrence and risk of death. If the, so if the cardiac functions after delivery, they have uh, not come back to normal, Oh, and if she gets uh, like uh, pregnant again, so there is a very high chances of recurrence and death in the subsequent pregnancy, that is 25%. So in, in your exam, if you find a patient uh, who had a PPCM and uh, that is not, uh, she, that is, uh, not get uh, uh, corrected, so risk of recurrence and death there is a, um, in subsequent pregnancy will be 25%. Okay. And because of this, these patients, because of such, such a high risk of death, usually these patients are uh, advised 
for contraception and what will be the choice of contraception funny um, it will be a progesterone so usually implant is a choice you will get question from this line also even if uh, you uh, uh, the patient uh, gets okay and her cardiac function come back to normal then also there is a risk of recurrence but it will be lower than 25% okay then if any patient who had ppcm and she wishes to get pregnant again and then before she plan for pregnancy uh, exercise stress echocardiography has to be done so this much knowledge about ppcm is enough so th with this knowledge uh, part 3 a station applied knowledge can be answered and all questions of part two can be answered so any one of you have got any question with ppcm ma'am this 25 percent is a death rate or a recurrence rate if death it rate. is not resolved death rate death okay that and this uh, okay and this is from the nelson prc new edition okay Now, so uh, after that PPCM, another type of second type of cardiomyopathy is a dilated uh, cardiomyopathy that is DCM. So usually in dilated cardiomyopathy, it is genetic. So usually family history is there. So all family member has to be screened. And because of so much of dilatation of heart, heart is doesn't work properly. So there is increased risk of embolization. So anticoagulation has to be started for these patients okay so this much knowledge about dcm is enough apart from this nothing is required then again you will get question uh, part two people will get question from uh, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so you have to know that this is uh, autosomal dominant okay then uh, it again the ventricle will have a thick wall so there will be reduced in cavity size and also reduced in the vol cavity size and volume of the ventricle so in this patient, if the ventricle function are fine, then pregnancy will be tolerated. Other, otherwise, like there will be problems in the pregnancy. So I, the output may be compromised if there had been bleeding. So uh, if there had been tachycardia and if there had been vasodilatation. So usually uh, uh, any blood loss has to be treated very aggressively because they have got very poor uh you know um, the adaptation apart from this nifedipine should be avoided as a tocolytic because it will cause vasodilatation so there will be uh, uh, so there, uh, there will be less amount of uh, like blood that will reach to heart and uh, usually that uh, because of this uh, diastolic dysfunction arrhythmia can be there if arrhythmias are there and if there is a possibility of uh, any embolism so consideration for anticoagulation has to be done. So, and when, whenever you examine this patient, usually they will have a double impulse, cardiac impulse. So it is a spike dome impulse. Sometime in the, you will find double impulse or they can have a, a triple ripple apical impulse also. So these are the signs that you will find in the physical examination. This I have put from the internet and why it is important because usually you will find this question you have to diagnose what is the condition. So this will be the buzzword. Either they will write uh, uh, like uh, um, spike and dome pulse, they can write bi pulse or they can write triple apical uh, impulse. So if that kind of condition is there, then you are dealing with a patient of HOCM. So now again, after cardiomyopathy, it is the artificial wall. Artificial wall, uh, there, there could be so many questions. And also, uh, there could be a station uh, for uh, uh, part three also. So this knowledge of um, artificial wall is very really important. Usually, when the wall replacement is there, so uh, there are two types of wall, walls are put. So this will be the mechanical heart wall. Mechanical ha heart wall were usually metal walls, and this way this would require uh, lifelong anticoagulation. 
so usually this people will be at a you know uh, uh, anticoagulate they would be uh, usually these people would be on warfarin high dose okay and so um, for metallic valve another will be graftive tissue heart valves these are uh, from either from the human or either from the uh, pigs okay they uh, they have an advantage that in that anticoagulation is not required but uh, because these are bio valves so this wall will deteriorate so within 10 to 15 years the further replacement would be required okay so this little information is required about the valves but the main problem will uh, main thing that is required from the not this applied knowledge part only so usually they have got a risk of uh, valve thrombosis so they would require full anticoagulation during the pregnancy also if the metal valve is there usually uh, these women are on the warfarin or vitamin k antagonist uh, k antagonists or vka so they are very good because they uh, prevent thrombosis in the mother but as the warfarin it has got so much effect on the pregnancy like it is associated with teratogenesis there could be miscarriage there could be stillbirth there could be bleeding so because of all this uh, fetal side effects are there therefore change is required in the pregnancy fine so usually the change is done and uh, heparin is given heparin we already know it is the safe in pregnancy and if, and they this woman will require high dose of it okay so uh, they would require adjustment according to anti tna levels consideration for low dose aspirin can also be done as an adjunct therapy okay this is from the strategy so uh, uh, you have to know this because if the strategy writes low dose aspirin in this patient and if you get that in your question so you can put that in the answer as well now uh, what we, uh, what could be done for the anticoagulant regimens in pregnancy usually three types of things can happen either patient will continue with the warfarin throughout pregnancy so this could be one possibility but in that case close monitoring of inr will be required and inr has to be between 2.5 and 3.5 second option uh, there will be therapeutic dose of low molecular uh, weight heparin can be uh, given in first 12 weeks of pregnancy like when the woman get pregnant and she was on warfarin so there will be change so uh, in the first trimester to avoid that teratogenic uh, teratogenic risk so uh, first 12 of uh, weeks of pregnancy she would be given heparin and after 12 week uh, she would be uh, um, given warfarin okay but uh, warfarin also has to be stopped uh, after 36 weeks of pregnancy then she will again convert it into heparin so this will, this is another kind of regimen third type of regimen where she will take uh, low molecular weight heparin therapeutic dose two times daily throughout the pregnancy okay so there are three type of things can happen either warfarin will continue throughout pregnancy second uh, high dose therapeutic twice daily uh, heparin will continue throughout pregnancy third thing in first 12 weeks she will be on heparin from 12 to 36 weeks she will be on a warfarin and after 36 weeks she would be on uh, heparin so there are three types of anticoagulant regimen that can happen for this uh, if a woman that who has a metallic wall in the pregnancy okay now uh, this uh, if the patient is on warfarin then uh, warfarin can be taken till 36 weeks okay then uh, uh, or she uh, warfarin has to be stopped two weeks prior to delivery because it has to be cleared off from the fetus therefore it is discontinued two weeks before fine and whenever uh, whenever we are waiting for warfarin to wash off from the body again patient will be put on the uh, heparin so if this, this will help you if if the second regimen is being offered not opted to the, by this woman okay and when the warfarin uh, uh, once the delivery is there for again heparin will be resumed after delivery 
and uh, heparin will continue at least five to seven days. After that, this patient will put back again on the warfarin. But uh, warfarin usually started after five to seven days uh, uh, following delivery because of the risk for, for hematoma. So this part we have read in the VT risk uh, uh, guideline also. Okay, so warfarin has to be started after four, five to seven days of the delivery. Okay, but another situation can happen that patient is fully anticoagulated. Uh, patient is on warfarin. And all of a sudden she has come in labor and you have to deliver this patient. So what you will do if the patient is on warfarin, then this is called as a reverse anticoagulation. So you have to reverse her anticoagulation. So reverse, if the patient is on the warfarin, then this anticoagulation can be reversed by using prothrombinase complex or vitamin K. Mm. Any question? Any question? Okay. Is the thing clear or it is getting complicated? It's clear, ma'am. Okay. So if the patient uh, is in uh, uh, on the warfarin and she uh, you have to deliver her in that situation, what you will do? You have to do reverse anticoagulation. So for reverse anticoagulation, if the patient is on warfarin, so you can, uh, the things that are used is prothrombinase complex, okay, and vitamin K. But if the patient is on heparin and uh, she she landed up in that for the delivery, then you have to reverse this and the antidote or reversal for heparin will be protamine sulfate. Okay, and why we are worried about the metal valves? Because if, if adequately, uh, anticoagulation doesn't happen then there is a risk of wall thrombosis or cva okay apart from this uh, if uh, 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 there is a risk of intra abdominal bleed secondary pph vaginal vault vaginal hematoma so these are the uh, this can happen uh, all can happen in postnatal period therefore we are so much worried about them and what the embrace says if there had been a, a new cardiorespiratory symptom, absence of valve clicks in the patient of prosthetic valves, urgent echocardiography has to be done because there is a risk of valve thrombosis. So why we are worried in this woman is because of this valve thrombosis and also because of this bleeding. Now, nice guideline. So this is the uh, this is from uh, strategy. But nice guideline, uh, some update. I have made a summaries of that. So I think that would be helpful. So this is the update from nice guideline 2019. Okay. Now, if the patient is on warfarin. So uh, if a patient, uh, this is the situation when the patient is on war, uh, uh, who was taking uh, warfarin in third trimester, then what you will do? This is the just sum up from the guideline. I have said this earlier, same thing. We have to stop warfarin two weeks before planned birth or by 36 weeks. After that, what you will do? Uh, uh, you will wait for 24 hours after stopping warfarin. Then she would be started with heparin. That will be two times daily on her recent body weight. Then whether the anticoagulation is done correctly or not, so you will check them by anti 10 levels. Then once the target for anti 10 level is achieved, then weekly measurement of anti 10 level has to be done. So this is the sum, uh, summary or sum up of this part of the guideline. So this, um, so if they give you the uh, in the exam that patient is on the warfarin, what will be the next step? So this will be the serially. You have to say I'm repeating it again. You have to stop warfarin two weeks before planned birth or or you will stop by 36 weeks then next 24 hours uh, after 24 hours of stopping her warfarin heparin will be started and this heparin has to be taken two times daily measurement will be on the recent body weight then whether the anticoagulation uh, is in a right manner or not checking will be done by anti-10a levels then once the target levels are there, 
so these are the target levels okay so these are the uh, target levels so if the target levels are achieved then patient has to be uh, um, checked weekly uh, by anti tna levels so that to know that patient is perfectly anti uh, on anti coagulation so is the is the thing clear what the steps has to be taken if the patient is on warfarin Ma'am, what kind of dose of heparin will use? Will use high prophylactic dose or will use a therapeutic dose? In this uh, dose, it would be uh, therapeutic only because I think it will be therapeutic. Yes. They have not mentioned it, but it has to be therapeutic or like it, it will be on the body weight. What they are saying is the body weight. They have not mentioned it. Okay. They have not actually. They have not mentioned anywhere in the guideline. Ma'am, actually, uh, anti TNA uh, level is to be measured when she is on uh, therapeutic dose. Yeah. In prophylactic will, dose, we don't measure. Yes, and because she will be on a very high dose. So it will be, yeah. in my opinion, therapeutic or very high dose. It is already there. Okay. Then only that this much checking is done. Got it. Then usually if the patient is on metallic valve, okay, then we don't want them to go uh, on labor with their own choice. We offer them planned birth. Either we'll do induction or we'll do cesarean section. Okay. Now if you do cesarean section for the woman, who is on mechanical wall? So this is the summary. Uh, you will stop this uh, low molecular weight heparin 24 hours before. Okay, so in last, uh, like there was a confusion about therapeutic. So she is on therapeutic only. Therefore, they are stopping her 24 hours before. Okay. So if the patient, you are taking this patient for C-section, so uh, heparin has to be stopped 24 hours before. So uh, you have to do cesarean section within 24 hours, but if some delay is happening, so up to 30 hours is possible. Okay, then another situation, a uh, patient from low molecular weight heparin can be switched to uh, high molecular, uh, sorry, unfractionated heparin and unfractionated, if the patient is on unfractionated heparin, then that has to be stopped four to six hours before cesarean section. Okay, so only three lines you have to remember. You will offer them planned birth, either section or IUL. If it is C uh, CS, patient is on, uh, if uh, low molecular weight heparin, please stop 24 hours before. If it is patient is on uh, UFH, then it has to be stopped four to six hours before cesarean. This much knowledge is enough. You will get question from there only. Second part. Now, if you want to offer induction of labor, for this patient on the mechanical wall, then you have to set a aim. It uh, labor has to be reviewed by senior person, of course, but aim for delivery, it will be 12 hours from last dose of low molecular weight heparin. Okay, so like um, you will plan accordingly and within four to six hours from UFHS, UFH, if the patient is on unfractionated heparin, you will plan so that delivery should happen within the four to six hours um, from last dose of it. Okay, therefore, th they are following so much of protocols for the patient of mechanical heart valve disease. Therefore, they don't want them to come uh, all of a sudden for birth. So there has to be planned birth, either section or induction. Now, this part I have already said, but I'm speaking it again. If the patient is on warfarin and she has come back in the labor, so what you will do immediate treatment you will check her inr then you will never uh, uh, give further anticoagulation she has to be reviewed by obstetrician and you have to consider reversal of anticoagulation i have just spoken in last slide about that also so reversal of anticoagulation what will be done so if the patient is on warfarin so you can use pro prothrombin complex co con concentrate or vitamin k on the other side, if the same situation is there and patient is on heparin, so consideration of uh, re uh, reversal of anticoagulation 
it will be done with a protamine sulfate okay so this is from the guideline summary so uh, uh now the another import uh, once the labor is there so another important period will be postpartum period so if uh, what you will do in the po uh, so uh, when is the you will get question uh, what uh, at what time uh, there is a very high risk for uh, this thing uh, for embolism uh, thrombosis so it will happen 3 to 4 hours after birth okay so you will get this as a question now once the delivery is there so you have to start heparin so heparin can be started four to six after four to six hours okay now so heparin can be started after four to six hours after birth okay and now uh, 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 this patient has to be reviewed every hour for until the uh, anticoagulation is re-established so she has to be seen uh, every hour why because why we are so much worried because there is a risk of thrombosis within three four hours after birth so all this thing will happen and once uh, the patient is uh, on perfect anticoagulation then for seven days she will be on heparin after that she would start warfarin after seven days okay so here if we if you see a guideline of vte so they say warfarin can be started after five to seven days but in this guideline of uh, this thing in uh, in a nice guideline they are saying start warfarin after seven days so uh, how to like tackle the situation so if uh, any other embolism is there and you have to start warfarin you can uh, write the answer five to seven days but if the patient is on metallic wall and then a question is in that uh, uh, situation then you can write start warfarin after seven days okay so there is a difference in two guidelines there so i have put the both things and i'm explaining as well so you you may get question from this also then this part is also important and there will be a number of questions you will find from there so uh, i have uh, sum up this and this is the same you you uh, uh, we read from uh, from bte 37b guideline also so now if prophylactic heparin you have to give uh, after citing or removing epidural catheter you have to wait for uh, 12 hours for therapeutic heparin if you, you need to uh, give to this patient after uh, citing or removing catheter you have to wait for 24 hours that we already know for hip uh, prophylactic heparin we give, uh, wait for 12 hours for therapeutic we wait for 24 hours another thing so now a patient was in the regional anesthesia and the surgery had happened you have to give them uh, you you have to restart heparin so prophylactic dose can be restarted after 4 hours therapeutic dose can be restarted after 12 to uh, after 8 to 12 hours okay then if the catheter is already in, inside the patient's body you will never give heparin and if you have to remove catheter you have to wait at least 12 hours after last heparin dose okay you will find a number of questions from this slide so i have made this summary and i have added all points from the 37b guideline also and this guideline also so you will get a number of questions from this only so is the thing clear ma'am there is one confusion so if there is uh, if patient is on prophylactic heparin we wait for 12 hours before citing epidural catheter now a post delivery we don't give a heparin till catheter is there then again for 12 hours we uh, remove but then that has been already more than 12 hours so this is the confusion the last line the, the last line here. Yeah. Okay, this this line is good. no heparin while the pedal catheter in place. So that means practically, um, 
मैम वी वाइल पेशेंट वॉज ऑन हेपरिन ऑन प्रोफेलेक्टिक हेपरिन वी वेटेड फॉर ट्वेल्व आवर्स टू गिव स्पाइनल और एपिड्यूरल देन वाइल द epidural catheter was there we did not give her any heparin mm-hmm. and then we remove epidural catheter after 12 hours of last heparin so which is that because we did not give only so these are like uh, this could be the different different scenarios mm, that's for therapeutic dose therapeutic is not to be given in epidural catheter so phylactic dose we can give don't administer therapeutic so it is therapeutic dose we will not give okay okay got it. okay no no therapeutic that means high dose you will cannot give okay like yes, this part you. of the guideline this part so uh, don't administer therapeutic low dose heparin while epidural, epidural catheter is in place okay so therapeutic dose you will not give prophylactic can be given fine yes no i have seen one time question from the antibiotic prophylaxis so uh, the uh, if the patient who are on the uh, risk of in, uh, like if the valve valves are there so they could be the increased risk of infective endocarditis so uh, usually they don't offer antibiotic prophylactic if the patient is on a risk of uh, in, uh, like infective endocard endocarditis only there are two conditions where antibiotics are offered so just remember these two conditions because i have seen one question from this so i have put it so if patient has a previous infective endocarditis and if you are doing any procedure on her then a prophylaxis for, for antibiotic is required and if those patient who have got cyanotic uh, congenital heart disease and if this kind of patient are at a risk of uh, this thing um, in uh, risk of infective endocarditis then also antibiotic prophylaxis is required so these are the two condition where they would consider antibiotic prophylaxis if there is a risk of infective endocarditis only once i have seen this question and i have put this from a uh, nelson prc uh, new new edition then another thing uh, another lesions what could be there uh, you can get questions also this is the mitral stenosis so in the mitral stenosis usually what is the reason it is rheumatic we know that will be there in 75% of the cases so uh, what is the normal diameter it is 4 cm but if it is less than 1.5 in that situation the stenosis the in that situation the stenosis will be severe okay two third of the women will have complication with the mitral uh, stenosis so if they uh, like if they have got severe mitral valve stenosis and they see you before pregnancy so they you have to offer them uh, surgery either open closed or balloon mitral valvotomy or valve replacement so you will get question from this only you can even the part 3 people can get this station so you have this knowledge is important because accordingly you will uh, you know guide your role player what to do and for for part 2 people you can get question so if the severe ms is there she, the, it they, um, they have to uh, like they have to go surgery before they plan for pregnancy then uh, treatment would be usually will be diuretics beta blockers and anticoagulation now this part i have taken from strategy so i found that to be important so if the patient with mitral stenosis is there so have to avoid tachycardia and also fluid overload so why fluid overload should not be there because in mitral stenosis patient there would be back flow and there would be because valve is stenosed blood cannot go forward in forward direction so there would be a back flow so there will be increased chances of pulmonary edema okay and we don't want this pulmonary edema to happen therefore uh, use fluid overload has to be avoided and uh, so tachycardia and fluid overload two things you have to avoid in the patient of mitral stenosis so why you have to avoid tachycardia because 
uh, it reduces the filling time also it increases uh, right atrial pressure so risk of pulmonary edema now what the treatment will be given so it will be beta blocker so the cardiac heart rate will, will be less so ventricle will get more time to fill one second uh, there should be like uh, there uh, a short second stage of labor so consideration for elective forceps delivery or like operative delivery there should be good analgesia for these women there should be continuous monitoring because there is a risk of arrhythmia usually supine or lithotomy position is avoided and the patient has to be in left lateral position then a methargin or sintomatrin has to be avoided why because it will cause severe contraction there will be rapid auto transfusion so there will be increase in the fluid overload pulmonary edema can happen so uh, this has to have a careful fluid management during pregnancy during labor uh, a, a consideration of even diuretics may be done and patient should be kept on the dry side that means we have to be very careful for fluid overload so these are the few things about the intrapartum care of women with a mitral stenosis and this i have taken from strategy so any questions about this mitral stenosis no question okay then uh, aortic stenosis so in aortic stenosis uh, like uh, uh, we have to avoid fluid de depletion so in atrial stenosis we have to avoid fluid overload overload of fluid but in as we have to avoid fluid depletion fine so what could be the symptoms of stenosis usually it is congenital so symptom occurs in third or fourth uh, like uh, uh, symptoms occurs late so there would be chest pain there could be syncope there could be uh, heart failure or sudden death may occur in aortic stenosis so these three things this you have to know because you have, you will get question from this then uh, usually any blood loss regional analgesia will compromise cardiac output so main objective is to avoid any hypotension from either from blood loss either from epidural either from vena cava compression so fluid depletion has to be avoided so what will be the principle of management so like avoid hypotension patient should uh, like uh, placed in left lateral position there should be early placement of arterial line and consideration for left uh, like uh, uterine displacement because that will then prevent uh, vena cava compression consideration of oxytocin infusion rather than giving uh, like bolus dose of oxytocin then and if the postpartum hemorrhage occurs so you have to be very careful because this woman they will not tolerate the fluid depletion so consideration for mechanical compression or mesoprostol they can be given that at as we, we already know methargin is is contraindicated in almost all cardiac conditions okay so this much knowledge is enough for uh, atrial stenosis and this is again from the strategy regurgitant walls are usually well tolerated so much of issues are not there why because there is increased forward flow so uh, again in pregnancy stenotic wall were associated with the high risk than regurgitant wall so maybe you will get some question from, uh, this can occur come as a stem of spa and uh, like women with a mechanical wall are more are more risk of uh, high risk during pregnancy what are the risk that i have already explained now few things about arrhythmia sometime you will find question about arrhythmia also though it is very less so whenever the woman has come with the arrhythmia once i think i saw question of arrhythmia also so uh, if the arrhythmia patient has arrhythmia these are the investigations thyroid function test hemoglobin ecg 24 hour and echocardiography what will be the treatment choice reassurance and if the patient has atrial fibrillation then consideration for anticoagulation apart from this beta blocker adenosine to terminate the episodes of uh, svt and it can be taken safely in the pregnancy also 
and if this patient is not responding to uh, responsive to medical treatment then dc cardioversion so i think i have seen question from here so answer was uh, like dc cardioversion so that you have to know you have to offer medical treatment in form of beta blocker adenosine but if you if the patient is not getting corrected consideration for dc cardioversion can be done you sometime uh, there are cardiac defibrillators are uh, devices are there for this woman so when they go for delivery this uh, devices has to be switched off then uh, once the delivery is there so they have to turn on again before the, this woman get discharged from the hospital then some inherited arrhythmias can be there like long qt syndrome so if it is there then uh, uh, like discussion and testing of baby would be there why because it could be inherited thing fine long qt syndrome so it could be inherited thing and flecainide is a drug of choice for tachyarrhythmia in fetus this i have seen one question about the flecainide also so i have put it here okay so this much knowledge about arrhythmia is enough now i think this is the last thing that i have okay so aortic dissection you will get questions from the aortic dissection and uh, it is you know questions are asked many times usually uh, you will get a scenario when this patient will have a acute severe chest pain she will have a uh, she will, uh, uh, like almost tearing tearing uh, ch chest pain with the intracapsular radiation and there will be uh, associated systolic hypertension okay so this kind of scenario is usually there answer you have to put as a diagnosis so answer will be aortic dis the dissection okay and what are the uh, uh, like uh, where this dissection can happen marfan syndrome we just read internal syndrome aortic dissection can happen and it is 2% in uh, eds syndrome type 4 okay you have to remember this because i have seen question from this also type 4 um, eds uh, aortic dissection can happen coarctation of aorta we just read that aortic dissection can happen and bicuspid aortic valve so this much you have to know about aortic dissection usually the question comes from diagnosis okay and etiology so the, you will get answer from here then how you will diagnose by chest x ray or by ct scan or mri what is the treatment aortic dissection treatment usually it is uh, so surgical okay careful and rapid control of blood pressure because systolic hypertension will be there and expedition of delivery by cs cardiac surgery to replace aortic root this much you know knowledge is not required but i have to complete the topic so i have put all about diagnosis and management but usually you will get question from this only okay this is from the guideline this you have to remember so what are the what are the indication for elective cs so any disease of aortic that uh, uh, any aortic disease like for example in marfan syndrome if the aortic root is more than 4.5 cm you have to consider elective section if a pulmonary arterial hypertension indication for elective section okay someone was asking this question so they they the, uh, this uh, nice guideline says the pah is an indication for elective section uh, heart disease 3 and 4 category it is indication for elective section this is uh, some of from the nice guideline you will get question directly from here then what the guideline wrote about the strict fluid imbalance so strict fluid balance so the, the, these are few conditions where Uh, you know dry side of uh, patient should be kept in dry side or there has to have a strict fluid uh, balance so these are the uh, stenotic lesion okay these are the stenotic lesion and hocm this is again causes you know so much of hypertrophy so usually it behaves like uh, this uh, stenotic stenosis thing so hocm and if ventricular dysfunction is there if pulmonary hypertension is there fontan circulation and if nyha uh, 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 stage 4 disease so these you have to remember this because part two people you will get question from there what are the patients or with the heart disease that would where the fluid balance will be critical so this you have to remember 
uh, like stenotic lesion, HOCM, cyst uh, uh, cardiomyopathy with systolic ventricular dysfunction, PAH, Fontan circulation, and uh, class 4 heart disease. So what they want? So if the this type of woman is there, then uh, like uh, what they want in fluid balance monitoring. So I have just sum up here. There should be hourly checking of pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. There should be continuous uh, ECG for this patient. There should be continuous intraatrial blood pressure monitoring. There should be cardiac output monitoring by serial echocardiography. Okay, so this way the monitoring can be done if uh, you are giving fluid to the woman where the fluid balance is critical or they have got uh, for optimal cardiac function. You can get part two people can get question from here. Now they said uh, for uh, WHO one category and w uh, NYHA one category, standard fluid management can be done. This is offer, okay. For two, uh, for two and three category WHO and two and three category NYHA, you can consider standard fluid management. Okay, so type one you can offer standard fluid management. Two and three you can consider standard fluid management. So I just put it from the internet. What are WHO uh, class one, class two, class three, and class four? So uh, in class four, usually the pregnancy is contraindicated okay because because there is a very high risk of mortality nobody can remember such big table but please uh, just read this with these points because you know you have to know where the pregnancy is contraindicated so if the pulmonary arterial hypertension that we already know risk of mortality is 30 percent if a peripartum condition like a ppcm we already know high risk of death in the subsequent pregnancy is 25%. If severe MS or AS is there, okay, we already know there will be very high uh, in severe if the diameter is less than 1.5. So in that also, they are saying contraindication for pregnancy. Marfan, if it is more than 4.5, there is a risk of death. So they, they just want this. And aortic root dilatation more than five, if it is associated associated with a bicuspid aortic valve disease so few things you already know at least from this table you remember who risk class 4 okay that will help you in answering questions this is from internet okay this is from internet now heart failure so heart failure if uh, if, if it is there so we already know maternal health will be given more priority. Then uh, uh, usually ACE inhibitors are avoided because they have cardiogenic, uh, uh, teratogenic effect. Cranial syntosis and heart effect can happen. So you will get question from there. Cranio, uh, cranial syntosis and also uh, uh, heart effect. So you will find question from there. And it also causes renal failure in fetus and neonate. So you will get question from there. Okay. Beta blocker be, can be given in the pregnancy to control heart rate. Furosemide can be given, but it is associated with uh, neonatal thrombocytopenia. So you will get question from this thrombocytopenia. Deoxin can be given. Okay. Now this is from the uh, guideline. So what are the symptoms of cardiac failure? Breathlessness pink frothy sputum breathlessness when lie down okay uh, pink frothy sputum uh, pnh that patient uh, has to wake up from sleep okay and they may produce pink frothy sputum uh, and they in they are uh, like uh, improved by moving to an upright position so pnh can be there palpitation can be there so these are symptoms of uh, heart failure. What could be the sign? So this is the sign. You may get question from there. There will be tachycardia. There will be increased respiratory rate, hypotension, systolic less than 100. Okay. So, so the heart failure patient will have less, uh, like they will have hypotension. Saturation, because it may be less than 95. 
on air jvp may be high additional hot sound or can be there there could be reduce uh, uh, air entry basal cracks wheeze on listening chest so these are signs of heart failure that you will get when the patient you, you will examine this patient look of the patient will be pale uh, sweaty agitated with cold peripheries then if the uh, you are there and you have got a suspicion of heart failure in the intrapartum period you are dealing with the patient so how what you will do you will do this test so patient should have an iv access there should be urea and electrolyte full blood count monitoring of a, you will do abg arterial blood gases ecg and chest x ray so you may get question from this part also part two people then uh, now if the uh, you, uh, patient is coming has come you 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 have got suspicion for heart failure then what you will do you, you are not able to diagnose it you will get the patient reviewed by a cardiologist you arrange for echo and the uh, measurement of end terminal bro pain pro brain uh, natri uh, ure ureteric peptide so this you can do okay so uh, usually you will get question from this part therefore i have put it this is from the guideline only now if a patient has got a heart failure due to cardiomyopathy you have to consider early birth okay otherwise this patient will deteriorate so that's all i have to you know teach about the cardiac thing so i try to compile the things all congenital thing all acquired thing guideline talk whatever it is possible so uh, anyone of you have got any question can ask me before i give questions to you any question no question fine so this is the question for you guys so read this then i will show you choices again so these are the choices so what could be the answer Then please show the question again. Peripartum. Peripartum cardiomyopathy. Yes. So what are the key words? Here, le left ventricular uh, dilatation is there, and ejection fraction is less than forty-five. Okay, less than forty-five. then she is para 10 so she is multi para so these are uh, risk uh, these are uh, like keywords that will help you in diagnosis apart from this she is last part of, she is third trimester so 32 weeks 42 years of age now age high advanced age late pregnancy echocardiography less than 50, uh, 45% of uh, uh, and there is a, a para 10 so all these are the factor that will help you in diagnosis of cardiomyopathy peripartum cardiomyopathy see this question aortic dissection yes aortic dissection so she has uh, marfan syndrome uh, severe chest pain radiating to back intracapsular area systolic hypertension c systolic hypertension answer is aortic dissection mitral stenosis what is that click when the click happens mitral 
mitral valve prolapse so uh, click mid stolic click is the diagnostic for mid mitral valve prolapse Again, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Yes. Uh, so this patient has got orthopnea. Typical uh, impulse is displaced in cardiomegaly. So it has to be peripartum because uh, yeah, she, she is peripartum cardiomyopathy. Hmm? Ma'am, please show the options once. So double, she has got double epical, double epical impulse is there. So sudden death, okay, sudden death, then uh, cousin sudden death, and these are uh, inherited, ejection systolic murmur, but uh, double epical impulse. So it is answer will be HOCM, okay. And uh, I just told spike and dome impulse. This is a double uh, epical impulse, or even triple ripple epical impulse can happen. So these are the keywords that will help you in in finding question. Option B. What you say? B. B. Um, and is it C? There has to be increase or, or preload, decrease after load, increase output by 20% uh, by eight weeks, and decrease colloid osmotic pressure. It is C. Okay, is it increase uh, preload, decrease after load? That I showed you, uh, showed you as a picture, and there is increased cardiac output 80%, and decrease colloid osmotic uh, pressure also because of this vasodilatation. It will happen. So answer will be C.
E option, ma'am. Younger maternal age is not a risk factor. Okay, yes. I'm going to Advanced maternal age is a risk factor. So in our uh, in our question also, patient was 42 years old. Is it A, Yes. E, ST elevation. Yeah, I already told. The elevation will be the more significant. C option, no? Okay. Yes, so multi MDT, avoid tachycardia, echocardiography, and anticoagulation. This we discussed also. Tolerated pregnancy well. Yes, because she is repaired and she, uh, she has a repaired lesion. She is asymptomatic and she has got mild regurgitation and all regurgitation are tolerated well in pregnancy. So answer would be she would be likely tolerate pregnancy well because she is asymptomatic. So she is WHO risk two. E option Ellen uh, mechanical prosthetic mature. Yes. yes, mechanical prosthetic wall are more at risk. Okay, so that's all for it. So, anyone of you have got any question can ask me. Yes, 